Hey everybody, welcome to World History. So this is going to be our very first lecture of the school year. So I want to go over how we do notes in here just so you guys are aware for that. So in my class, we use fill in the blank notes just like these ones here. As you will see as we go through the notes, each line corresponds to a spot on the slides. Sorry, having some slight technical difficulties, first video back and all. Um, my apologies for that. So at this point, um, so for our very first blank, it's going to be this term here, rebirth. You're just simply going to go through, and as we're going through the notes, you're just going to write down the information as it corresponds to the various blanks and stuff that we're going to be going over. So on that note, Go ahead and get your notes out, and let's get started. As soon as my computer decides, it has decided to cooperate. All right. So we're talking about the Renaissance. So this is really starting to begin in the year 1500 and going to present day is where we're going to go for this class. Now, the Renaissance is a period of rebirth. It's also known as a time of creativity and change. We're seeing a lot of change in politics, society, economics, and culture. We'll talk about all of those either today or in future lectures. It's also a return to learning in the classics, specifically from Greece and Rome. It's a period of exploration and individual achievements, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It's also as what we historians refer to as a transition from medieval times to the modern world. Really, it's the Renaissance is marking off the cutting point to what we consider to be ancient history and modern history. So, humanism. It's an intellectual movement that focused on the education of people and the classics. It even formed its own branch of studies known as the humanities. The subjects such as grammar, rhetoric, poetry, and history, mainly the classics of Greece and Rome. We also here have a debate among early Christians about being too worldly, worldly, worldly excuse me, versus being religious. And we also do have an important figure to talk about, this gentleman here, Petrarch. Now, he was based in the city of Florentine in Italy and was a Renaissance humanist poet and scholar. He also maintained one of the largest libraries of Greek and Roman works in the Renaissance era. Now, when we talk about this, Italy is a major player when it comes to the Renaissance. It's a crossroads of trade. Uh, banking, manufacturing, and merchants are all based here, and it was the center of the classical world, being the home of the Roman Empire. Along with its unique architecture, Catholicism, and its religious themes, and the idea of cultural diffusion, the Renaissance truly got its start here in Italy. Now, as a reminder, cultural diffusion is the process in which culture spreads out over a geographical area over time. So we're going to talk a lot about how the Renaissance ideas began to spread across Europe. We also have to talk about city-states, each of them being controlled by wealthy and powerful merchant families, and the city of Florence being the birthplace of the Italian Renaissance. Uh, here's an image of it today. Now, we have to talk about the Medici family, a very wealthy family that controlled the city of Florence. Uh, with Cosimo de' Medici in 1434 and their uncrowned rulers, uh, also, Lorenzo the Magnificent who represented the ideal ruler. They were major patrons of the arts or financial supporters. They were people that went out to artists and be like, hey, paint me a painting. I'll pay you for it. Or, hey, you're right place. I commission you to write a play for me. Now, the Renaissance is just as much a period of uh, change in society as it was in art. Now, this reflected humanism. It portrayed religious themes, well-known figures, and reflected individual achievements, and it's where art embraced realism, meaning the people in the paintings looked like real people. So a lot of new techniques were being used, including perspective, essentially making paintings three-dimensional, and created depth in pictures with vanishing points. So as you can see with these lines, this is the vanishing point of this painting, and this painting here, the School of Athens, its vanishing point is right here on the horizon. We also see a study of human anatomy, which means the people being portrayed in the art look anatomically correct. So let's talk about our first Ninja Turtle of the day, Leonardo da Vinci, who was alive from 1452 to 1519. 
Uh, famous paintings include the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. He also provided the idea of the Renaissance man, someone of broad achievement with talent in many areas. Think of it as like today's version of a jack of all trades. They exemplified curiosity, interest in the classics, adventurous spirit, and emphasized the importance of education. Uh, Michelangelo, our next famous artist, uh, was alive from 1475 to 1564. He was a sculptor, engineer, painter, architect, and poet. Uh, he created the Statue of David, right down here, that reflected the harmony and grace of ancient Greece. He also created the Paita, or a statue of the biblical Mary cradling her dead son Jesus. He is also responsible for painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling murals, which took four years to complete. In this, he covers the biblical history of the world, essentially the creation to the flood as told in Noah's Ark. He also designed uh, the St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, which directly influenced the architectural design of the United States Capitol building. Uh, here's a nice map of the uh, entire Sistine Chapel. And there it actually looks like. Now, that being said, the Sistine Chapel actually has one of the most unique uh, humidity control systems in all of the world, mainly because of how they had to protect this painting. It's extremely susceptible to heat and humidity. And Italy is not exactly a cool place in terms of temperatures. Uh, here's some other pieces of Michelangelo's art, including this one up here. This is the Paita. Our next turtle is Raphael, who was alive from 1483 to 1520. He blended the Christian and classical style. He also painted the School of Athens painting that we talked about earlier, an imaginary gathering of the great scientists and thinkers at the height of ancient Greece. He also uh, made portrayals of the Madonna, the mother of Jesus, or Mary, as well. Um, now that's a little bit on art. We're now going to focus on architecture for a little bit. Now, they rejected the Gothic-style architecture that was popularized during the Middle Ages and adopted things like columns, arches, and domes, as you can see from these pictures down here. Now, just comparing them a little bit, the Middle Ages art and in the Renaissance was still religious, but it changed as to who was funding the art. During the Middle Ages, it was mostly the church, but during the Renaissance, it was individual peoples. And Middle Age art, people were a little bit more long and stiff, in unnatural geometric patterns with little to no emotion. Whereas Renaissance art, again, people embracing the idea of human anatomy, made them look more realistic and actually displayed actual emotions. We can even do a same comparison for uh, even the styles. Middle Age art is more solid, patterned, scenes appeared flat, no clear light source. Renaissance art, on the other hand, was more natural, had depth and perspective, which we talked about earlier, and light and shadows. We can even compare and contrast the architecture. Uh, Middle Ages were more Gothic, churches were shaped like crosses, and homes were simple squares. Whereas as the Renaissance, architecture was designed to hug the earth, meaning they didn't change the landscape to build there. They changed the building to match the landscape. Uh, churches were circular or squared, and a lot of homes had their own courtyards. Uh, here's just comparing a couple pieces of art. This is a famous Middle Ages piece of art of the Madonna and Child, and then this is a painting by Raphael, also depicting the Madonna and Child as well. Now, when it comes to writing, we also have to talk about a focus on humanities in terms of writing as well. Now, it was based in philosophy and scholarship, and a lot of these early books were considered to be guidebooks, essentially like how to be successful for dummies in the Renaissance world. One of the most famous ones is Niccolò Machiavelli's The Prince, which you'll actually be reading an excerpt of as your assignment today. We also have uh, Balladesse, excuse me, Balladassari Castiglione and the Book of the Courtier, which describes the manners, skills, learning, and virtues a member of the court should have. Uh, and of course, I already mentioned him just a minute ago, Machiavelli and his book The Prince, a guide for rulers on how to gain and maintain power. He essentially advocated for using whatever methods were necessary to achieve your goals. Meaning, if you had to kill somebody, he told you to do it. Essentially saying the ends justified the means because you were in power. Uh, and then 
just here's a general map of the religious breakdown of Europe at the time. And that is actually it for notes for today. So I will actually see you all next time. Your assignment for tonight is to do that Machiavelli reading and then the 13.1 quiz. I will 